This is a lecture from Open Tuition. Welcome to this AAA Advanced Audit and Assurance Marking Workshop. We posted a past exam question, asked you to submit your answers, and then put those answers in the hands of a very experienced ACCA marker to see what she thought and to, for us to learn about the points that do get credit and don't get credit. Before you go any further, you should make sure that you've downloaded this question, Lifeson, and also had a good look at it so that you can feel what the question is about and then my comments will make more sense. So if you need to, pause the recording, download the question and spend 10 minutes or so having a good read. Now Lifesome is a typical review style question, the sort of thing that you would see in question two in the current syllabus. When you look at the requirements of this 25 mark question, the first requirement is asking us to consider the matters that we should think about and the evidence that we should find in a review of the working papers that have been prepared by audit junior staff. So as usual, we take on this role of audit supervisor or audit manager. In the second part of the question, we were then asked to think about the impact of certain items on the audit report if they could not be resolved. The marker said that she was concerned about the audit report answers in particular, and it's very important that you look back at our learning materials. So in our study notes, it's chapters 23 to 25. Also, again, have a look at past questions, such as the question Blackmore, Blackmore, which was in the March, June questions. Have a look at the audit report part of that. Now, the whole point of this exercise is really to get you to think like a marker so that you are more critical of the points that you write down and therefore to make sure that the points that you make are more effective and therefore will maximise our marking opportunities. The first thing to say is 25 marks means that you could get full marks with 25 sentences. I think some candidates feel they need to do 25 paragraphs, but 25 good sentences would give you full marks. Logically, therefore, 13 good mark sentences would give you 13 marks, enough to pass. And many answers to this exam are always too long. After you've looked at this recording, please read the article on the ACCA website which is called Read the Mind of an ACCA Marker, which helps you to think about the process the marker goes through when they look at your script. I'm going to start by just looking a little bit at the scenario that we have in front of us. So the company has a year end of March. We're at the review stage on the 1st of July. So about three months later, the field work has been done apart from last minute adjustments. We're told the profit is 2.15 million. We're told the assets are 13.8 million. And that of course is to help us think about materiality. There were three transactions there. The first one, was about a sale and lease back. And when we're considering a sale and lease back, we've got to think about, first of all, whether it is a sale and lease back 
or simply a secured loan. Sometimes, if you sell the asset and then rent it back for its whole life, it's a secured loan, so it doesn't really come within the sell and lease back rules. So we had to consider that. And then, of course, we'd have to consider whether the accounting treatment was correct. Broadly, it sounded as if the accounting treatment was probably correct because it sounded like they were de-recognizing the asset. You had the feeling that they seemed to have the idea, but obviously the numbers may not be perfect. So there are a few things to challenge in respect of that. In respect of the second transaction, which was the investment property, something changed from PPE to investment property. And then they started to use the fair value model, which is perfectly normal. And when, of course, it changes from PPE to investment property, the initial gain has to go to OCI. Later gains would then go to P&L. And so when you came to read this and look at the scenario, you perhaps realized they had made a mistake because the initial gain should have gone into other comprehensive income, but it sounds like they've recognized everything in the profit and loss. Finally, there was a shopping mall. The shopping mall again, first of all, had been impaired by 775. And it says, that had been recognized in the profit and loss, which sounds good. And then there was a reversal of impairment. And surprisingly, the reversal of impairment exceeded the original impairment loss. And there seemed to be something strange going on because that credited a greater number to P&L than that originally debited in the previous year. So again, even if we couldn't fathom the numbers, we got the feeling that the profit was wrong by some number. Again, there was then some calculations to support what had happened, a loss going down, and then later a gain going up, as the asset again is gradually written down year by year. Now, in this style of question, Let's think for a moment what's actually required and what those requirements mean. So we are required, aren't we, to comment on matters. Remember, when you comment on matters, there are really two or three things you've got to do. The first thing you must do is assess the materiality of the item. And so we're always looking for a sentence that says, this is material because it is, or whatever the change is. So you'd have to be more specific about the word it, but because whatever the change is, is, and it could be X percent of profit before tax, or it could be X percent of assets. When we're thinking about profit before tax, things are material if they're greater than 5% of profit before tax. If it's assets that you're using as a benchmark, then you should start off by saying, well, greater than or equal to 1% of assets. So very, very, very straightforward to get that mark. And in many of these matters questions, you can get it three times um, without too much effort. The second thing, of course, is that we're trying to head towards audit risk. We're heading towards a risk of misstatement or material misstatement in the financial statements. And that, of course, is where you need to demonstrate your accounting knowledge. As you know, you're told to do this exam after strategic business reporting. In fact, in this question, you would have got away with it if you hadn't, because 
the accounting topics here are actually principally in financial reporting. But you must know them because the whole point of audit, of course, is to see if the accounting has been applied properly. So if we don't know our standards, again, it's not going to be good news. So they're the sorts of things that we think about with matters. Then, of course, later, we've got to consider the evidence. When we consider the evidence, again, your sentence structure needs to start with a thing. Um, again, grammatically, I might say a noun. That word might not be very helpful, but it needs to start with a thing. Just as if you were trying to arrest a murderer, the evidence would be the knife or whatever. So it will always start with a thing. The thing could be a working paper, which the auditor has been prepared. It could be a working paper the client has prepared. It could be um, something like a, um, a copy of the board minutes relating to some particular issue. It could be a copy of a bank statement confirming some particular point, but you're always looking for a thing. So it's something and what you must not write is inspect board minutes. That's a procedure. And if you keep starting with doing words like inspect or review, every single point is wrong. People say, well, will I get half marks? No, you'll get nothing. So you have to start with a thing, some record of something. And then probably the best way to finish the sentence is to confirm and then whatever you're trying to confirm. The working paper, again, to confirm the calculations of the client so that they did work on them or whatever. The copy of the board minutes to understand the decision for so-and-so. The copy of the bank statement to confirm the amount paid because that's needed in a specific calculation. That's evidence. So you have to set out your question in that way. You use two subheadings for each issue, one that says matters and one that says evidence. You must use subheadings and you must use those subheadings. In the other part of the question, we were asked about a report or the audit report. And I would recommend strongly that you structure your answer on audit reports in a very, very, very clear way. Now, when we come to look at, or when, as you've had a look at this question, you've probably got a fairly good idea anyway, but it turns out that in respect of the investment property, there's an error of 25,000. And again, that's because the 25,000 has been put to the profit and loss again, and it should have gone to OCI. In the third issue, there was an error, which I think eventually came out as 300,000. You may come to a slightly different number. It doesn't matter because you get follow through marks. But if we just accept both of those figures for the moment, what are we looking for in that second part of the question? In the second part of the question, the investment property and the shopping mall, where is the credit actually going? When you write about audit reports, again, I'm using a table just to keep things finite. I wouldn't use a table in the exam, but I'm just putting a column that says investment property and the mall or the shopping mall when you write up your audit report, first of all, explain the impact on the opinion. So the impact on the opinion, and I used four sentences. I would start out by saying the problem. In the first case, 
again, we could write it, we'd write it slightly better than this in the exam, I know. But in the first case, profit is overstated by 25. In the second case, profit is overstated by 300. So if you can't work out the number, just accept the number for a moment. Secondly, decide whether the problem is material or pervasive. That's when you do your calculation. The error on the first one, I think, is about 1%. It's a very small amount anyway. It's about 1.2% of profit. And the error on the second one, again, is 14% of profit. So we know what we're going to say, don't we? This first one is not material. And the second one is material. If you're saying what would make it pervasive, what would make it pervasive is 100% of profit. If it was so big that it turned the profit into a loss, that's pervasive. Pervasive is very rare. Now explain the modification. The modification to the opinion, so I'm just saying modification, there are only two words you can write. You can either write material misstatement or unable to obtain sufficient appropriate evidence. So this one, there's no modification. The second one is material misstatement. Because you have a material misstatement effectively, therefore, you can now reach your conclusion. And your conclusion in respect of the thing on the right, isn't it, is that you're going to give a qualified opinion. So talk about the opinion first, go through it logically. What's the problem? How big is it? Is it misstatement or evidence? What's your conclusion? Then just consider whether you need any extra paragraphs in the report. And wherever you have a modification, the one extra paragraph you will always have is that you will have a separate paragraph called basis of qualified opinion. So on the right, I will have a separate paragraph called basis of qualified opinion. Again, which would explain the problem. Explain the problem. So that's an overview of the question, but now we're gonna have a look at what you wrote and what the marker thought. One of the things that our marker noticed straight away was how the appearance of the script can completely change your impression. And although though the marking is totally objective, it is much, again, easier obviously on the eyes of the marker if you present your answer using sensible subheadings and in point form. So looking at the first script that you can see there, don't worry about what they've written. And if you wrote it, I'm not going to pick it apart, don't worry. But it looks fine, doesn't it? It's very clear that the candidate has said, here is the transaction and here is the evidence. So therefore, it's clear for the marker to work out what the candidate is talking about in each stage. If you look at this script, the second one, I can see a heading there that says matters and all the evidence. Well, it, it's not even a heading. It's really a very long sentence across here. But the marker now has to pick apart the answer and the marker is saying i wonder where the matters are i wonder where the evidence is 
Now, it is not true to say that you get one mark per paragraph, but sometimes if you said that to yourself, it would stop you doing this, where you can see very hard to try and work out the points that are being made and where the evidence is. So try and use subheadings, use very short paragraphs, and for something like evidence, I would certainly be using bullet points. Bullet points, of course, still mean sentences. You're still looking, aren't you, for a minimum of seven words to make sure you've explained everything. Next point is thinking about length of answers. So I think the first uh, part of the question was eight marks, six marks and six marks. Now within that eight, six and six, there's no capping for matters or evidence. So in theory, you could get all your marks on matters or on evidence. You'd be very silly because I don't think you would think of enough points that were sensible points. It's better to try and get some balance. But of course, picking out points again um, of evidence is usually a bit easier. But if we look at this answer here, this candidate has gone over the top. So this is one part of the question. And um, essentially, again, you know, they're writing far too many bits of evidence. And instead of writing a subheading that says evidence, they're writing in the working papers, I would expect to see evidence of. It's far too long, isn't it? So you should just have written evidence. When you actually come to have a look at this, in fact, many of the points are the same point because the first one is talking about disclosure in the balance sheet um, or possibly the profit and loss, not quite sure. The second one, again, disclosure of something else. The third one, more disclosure, so the disclosure, it's as if they've tried to pace it out over three points. Disclosure is a good point, but it only needs to be made once. What's then happened is they've been running short on time. So you can see when you look at the next one, copies of the lease agreement, but they've not said what they want to look at in the lease agreement. In this candidate's favour, though, I would say at least they are writing evidence properly. They're starting with a noun, a thing. The listing of assets, the listing of liabilities, the lease agreement, the notes of a meeting. So at least the format is right, but there's far too much down there to put scores on the doors. I said before, materiality is a couple of easy marks in the scenario. And of course, at any stage, just compare things sensibly when you're doing the matters and evidence. If something is a P&L item, compare it to profit. If something's a balance sheet item, compare it to assets. Remember the benchmark for profit is 5%. The benchmark for assets, 1%. So I'm looking here, this first one is perfect. The carrying amount of the investment property is 2.6% of assets, so it's material. Absolutely fine. However, the second one has tried to compare a warehouse to profit. Warehouse is in the balance sheet. It's not in the profit and loss account. So you're not comparing like with like. So we can't pick up a mark on materiality. But for each adjustment in a matters and evidence question, you can normally pick up one part by making a sensible comparison. So we're going to have a look at some of the accounting issues now. And first of all, we're going to think about issues in respect of the sale and leaseback. In the scenario for the sale and leaseback, 
it, there's always an issue about whether something is a genuine sale or just simply a secured loan. And the other issue, of course, is the calculation becomes complex. Now, let's have a look at this first statement here. And this would really get the markers back up because this candidate, again, apart from copying, I think, what's from the question, is determined to fit in the names of as many accounting standards as possible. If you were doing the exam 12 years ago, there was a time when standards got credit. Now they just irritate the marker. So don't play the game, name that standard. We don't want standard numbers in the exam. In fact, uh, the candidate has said it's the wrong treatment but they've not said why it's wrong in that first point there. And then they've changed them again from lessee to lessor. So it's just very confusing. So I hope you can see in fairness that can't get any credit. On the other hand, here's a super bit of the answer. And you might say, well, it's not that well explained. But if it's well explained enough for the marker to interpret it, it's absolutely valid. So they're saying there that the purchaser, Clive, is keeping the risks and rewards, implying there is a sale. And they've justified the lease by comparing the 10 and the 50 years. The fact is, isn't it, if you sell something that has a life of 50 years and rent it back for 10 years, that is a sale and lease back. You're not stuck with the asset at the end of its life. So a mark for comparing the 10 with the 50, a mark for actually confirming that risks and rewards, again, are staying with the person um, with the less or. So it is a genuine sale and lease back. The next one looks reasonable. However, um, essentially, most of it has been copied from the question because it said they were de-recognising the property. The point is, it's not very specific. I don't know what is meant by a discount cash flow method. Well, I do because I'm a tutor. But again, a person reading this script would not, and a judge certainly wouldn't in court if this working paper came into court. So you remember that with a sale and lease back, you have to recognise a right of use asset and it's a proportion of the earlier carrying value. But this is just too vague. This one would really upset the marker because the lease was not less than 12 months. So the candidate is dumping some knowledge in in the hope that it will work and it never does. So there we are. There are some of the matters in that first part. The key issues, I think, were number one, is it a genuine sale and lease back? Looks like the client is right. And have they got the right approach to the calculations? The second scenario was the investment property. So if we come back to that investment property, well, when you look properly at the question, when it was recategorized from PPE to investment property, change of use, perfectly okay, gain goes to OCI. And then over the next year, there's another gain and that gain goes to profit and loss. So the principal issue there, of course, is this is therefore an accounting error in respect of the change of use. Some things they've done correctly, as they're using the investment property model are a fair value, then depreciation is not charged. So that's absolutely correct. As I said before, a lot of problems arise because people don't have their basic accounting. That's a financial reporting standard, not strategic business reporting. So we should have that knowledge almost on the tip of our tongue. So coming back and having a look at what people wrote for that. There we are. Uh, 
Straightforward error. You should depreciate. It's not true. Once you've changed use, it becomes an investment property. If you're using the fair value model, then you don't depreciate, even if you can't get tenants. So actually, that's simply not true. It's a false thing. That's perfect, isn't it? So they were applying to the scenario. They intend to earn rentals. So we're setting the rule out. But I wouldn't actually have bothered to name the standard. There's another good one. Very clear. This gain should have been recognised in OCI. What would have been better is if they'd said this gain of 25. But, I mean, it doesn't matter. The objectively, the marker sees that what you're saying is accurate. You understand what is happening. In the last scenario, which was the shopping mall, so in the last scenario, which was the shopping mall, there was an impairment loss. And then later, again, that impairment loss was reversed. Again, we see an accounting error. The thing, of, remember the audit risk is about things that are complex, like the lease, and things that are judgmental. So I see a very judgmental word there when I see these words, value in use. Value in use is a very complex, judgmental calculation, so we should be challenging that in our comments. So in respect, in respect of the shopping mall, in respect of the shopping mall, then let's have a look at the comments the candidates actually made. Um, first of all, that one looks quite straightforward, doesn't it? There was a reversal. Again, um, it should not have been recognised in the PL. In fact, the candidate's calculation is wrong. It doesn't matter. It's still getting half a mark. The calculation takes them unravelling. And actually, again, um, you know, it's not worth it because... If you'd spent half an hour working it out, it would only have pushed up another half mark. We've all got the message, haven't we, that that impairment has been posted in the wrong place. Next sentence is almost as bad in this exam as saying risk that the accounts are not true and fair. It's too basic, too vague. It's not worth typing out. Obviously, there's a risk. You don't need to say that, do you? If you think something's wrong, you say specifically what it was wrong. So no reference here, again, in terms of the value of the asset or where any gain or loss should have been recorded. Utterly vague. No disrespect if that was your comment, but waste of time. Have a look at the next comment. Risk that they've incorrectly calculated the value in use. Fair point. They might want to uh, um, overstate profits. It would have been much better to say risk of overstatement of profits. However, to be honest, the intention of the candidate is there. It's clear that you, you meant overstatement. The danger is that we don't want to fill our answer full of what I would call fish market gossip. Fish market gossip is just claiming that everyone is committing a fraud unless there's a fraud risk indicator in the scenario. So it would have been better to say risk of overstatement again of profits they might wish to, but nevertheless, they deserve the mark. They understand the overstatement point. Here's another bit of knowledge dumping. We're talking about the reversal of an impairment loss this candidate is talking about the impairment loss. Not relevant. That happened last year. We don't want to know about that. So we're going to look now at some of the audit evidence that you were suggesting. On the sale and lease back, again, 
a very obvious piece of evidence has to be the sale and leaseback agreement. Um, when we look at this candidate, again, remember, each point gets a mark if it's very good. If it's not so good, it might get half a mark if you're a bit unspecific. So as I look here, this candidate has very craftily said a copy of the sale agreement and a copy of the lease agreement. Well, it's a good try, but it is a sale and leaseback agreement. So together, collectively, they're going to have one mark for that. Um, really, it's a single agreement and the evidence that's coming out of there. But, it, you know, otherwise, they, they are good points. Copy of the asset register. Well, the asset register would show that the property has been derecognized, but it's not very clear about what it is that you're concerned about them derecognizing or why. So as the marker is saying, again, it probably needs a bit more. So the value in order that they can calculate the profit or loss on sale. Bank statements, very popular evidence. They should get you half a mark if, you, if there's been a cash transaction in the year. But at this level in the advanced audit and assurance, you probably then need to be a bit clearer about exactly what you're going to do with the number in the bank statement. So essentially, again, why is it that you wanted to check the sales proceeds in the first place? Notice what the marker is saying here, uh, again, and the candidate, is they're very wisely asked for a copy. You can't put the original lease agreement on your file or the client will be very upset indeed. That's theft. So it's good to say copy. However, asking for a copy of the entire asset register, again, that would be the size of an enormous cardboard box or computer, is a bit optimistic. So extract from the as copy of extract from the asset register would probably be better. Here's a nice piece of evidence on the lease. Working paper prepared by the junior auditors confirming the carrying amount of the property. And really just again, so showing there that they've checked that it's been de-recognized and the profit actually properly calculated. Absolutely perfect evidence. Lovely. Well, the next two, you know you're on to a non-starter straight away. These two are both starting with verbs. So even before we start with this, these are procedures. Um, so they're not going to get anything anyway. But in fact, they're also completely irrelevant. So what do we mean by information is complete? I've no idea. Um, and why on earth the legal advisor? Again, why there's any litigation going on? I don't know. It's not relevant here. If it had been relevant, again, it would be letter from the company lawyer for whatever reason. Then you went to the investment property. Again, we've got the reference to the register. A bit unclear as to what actual date you're talking about in respect of the carrying amount of the investment property. Because, you know, there are three different dates in the scenario. So there's probably not enough detail there to actually score the full mark. But, you know, sometimes there's no special harm in getting half a mark. Board minute discussing change of use, agreeing date of move. That's plenty, isn't it? So it's not just saying board minute. You're illustrating the sorts of things that would be in the board minute as evidence. Very good. Explaining what it is the board were discussing. Good procedure. Then, unfortunately, these next ones are back in procedure land. So, obtain or prepare, again, no. That's all been done. So, had it been relevant, it would have been summary of PPE on working paper prepared by junior staff. It would have been copy of title deeds, had that been relevant. And again, 
it would have been copy of entry in statutory books, again, had it been relevant. Though the issue was about moving something from PPE to investment property, so I'm not sure why they want to see the, 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 the title deeds at the moment. On the shopping mall, they bought the mall years ago. So this person is asking the candidate, is asking the examiner to dig out the bank statement from ages ago, to go back in their files. Why? This would have been checked last year. A much better answer would have been to say that you confirm the opening balance to the prior year audit working papers, or even, you know, the prior year entry on the client register or ledger. But at the moment, don't go back and start vouching stuff that would have been audited in earlier years. Well, the next point, the reason why, that's not evidence, is it? So if the judge said, bring me the evidence, and you said the reason why, the judge would say, well, that's information. So it's just not evidence in the first place. I'm not also sure why this candidate thought there'd been a change in life, but that doesn't matter. This is better, isn't it? A copy of management's working paper showing their workings, again, showing the calculation of value in use, very, very, very clear. Um, and again, the point's been made there by the marker that if that had been a little bit more specific about looking at cash flow again, so essentially, again, the cash flows that made up the value in use, you could have gone further in earning marks. So there's an indication about the sorts of things would put scores on the doors with matters and evidence. Matters, we said right at the start, didn't we? Matters are where we assess materiality and also think about risk in the context of our accounting knowledge. Evidence, we start with a thing and say what that thing confirms. On the audit report, I've already suggested an approach where you look at the opinion and then the extra paragraphs, again, that might be included in the audit report. Let's have a look at some of your answers. Here we go again. Every time you name a number an accounting, an auditing standard in this case, it just grates down the back of a marker almost like when you grate down an old-fashioned blackboard at school. And in fact, there was nothing to do with post balance sheet events in the question anyway, particularly, so completely irrelevant. Shame. On the investment property, that was this issue here. Let me just find it. On the investment property, the error was 25. So when you do materiality, you should be comparing the 25 to the profit. Again, you know, you get follow through if you calculated the error incorrectly. But this person is not looking at the error. They're just looking at the carrying amount again. And the uh, again, so what we're interested in is the error, not the carrying amount of the investment property. So actually they're not really comparing the right thing with the profit for the year. Here's the profit, here's the error, is it material? Let's have a look at this. That's the same point, isn't it, that I made. Once you've explained the opinion, mention there'll be a basis paragraph after, which quantifies, again, the problem. So, great paragraph, great point. When you write about audit reports, try and break it down into short sentences. So this person has said in the same point, materially misstated, qualified, modified, so audit, they've also written audit report is modified. We are looking at the opinion, 
So I don't know where that's come from, but you know, so the audit opinion is modified on the grounds of material misstatement, but it's, it's all a bit of a mess, isn't it? There's no justification of why it's material. It's not really systematic enough. So as it stands at the moment, it's not going to earn more than half a mark. Um, and it really is, you know, a very confusing sentence. Make sure you break things down into short, bite-sized sentences so it's clear to see your logical process. Um, more referencing of an IIS. Um, so I don't know why they did you did that if you did it, but also it's not even true because um, financial statements are have to be prepared in accordance with all the standards, not just that one. And then we get to the next one. This person has said. The investment property and shopping mall are very material. I don't mind if you misinterpret the numbers and say it's material, but there is no such thing as very material. It's either material or pervasive. Material is 5% of profit before tax or 1% of assets. Pervasive, extremely rare, but like 100% of profit before tax. And then the sentence, again, gets very, very unclear, doesn't it? In fact, it's possibly better, especially if you wrote that sentence, not to read it again, because you might end up in a right mess as to what on earth is going on there. So the message should be simple, isn't it? It is material. That would lead to a qualified opinion. Finished. Another point the marker made is make very sure that you are not sitting on the fence at this level. So make sure you've got off the fence. It's important you reach an opinion in the same way as if you went to see the doctor about something and you said, what would you advise doctor? And the doctor said, I don't know. You wouldn't want to pay them, would you? So, you know, you need to be very clear. This is my conclusion. Finally, almost, this question said, what should happen in the report? This person, again, has now decided to say something else. This is, it should be reported with those charged with governance. When would you write that? You'd write that if the question was, should this be reported to those charged with governance? So it needs to be very, very tight in the way that you write it. Here's a great one. The next one you can see, miscalculation is material. It's not pervasive because it doesn't affect the whole financial statements. Some people would say most part is a strange expression. It doesn't matter. So in most part, you, it's very clear, isn't it, to the market. It means that the accounts as a whole will be wrong. That's what would make it pervasive. In this case, of course, it's not relevant. And finally, of course, you can see the last one is a contradiction. Please, the opinion is called qualified or adverse, isn't it? So I know except for is the wording. Forget that. Opinions are qualified or adverse. And of course, they can't be the same in the same point. And as you know, if it was unable to get the evidence, it's going to be qualified or disclaimer. Well, that's it. I hope you kind of appreciate the way that the ACCA markers are working and how specific you need to be in the exam. Please, I always say to my students, in some ways, the shorter answers are the better ones. So on a 25 mark question, if you find you're writing more than 25 points, they're not very good. In theory, if you're extremely brave, again, you could just write 13, following the approach that we've suggested. We're not gonna do that, are we? But then keep the points short, simple, 
maximize your knowledge. So hopefully that's been of some help. Please go away after this and make sure if your audit report knowledge is rusty, that you are looking at the OT notes, the open tuition notes, which are very comprehensive on this, chapters 23 to 25. Have a look as well at that March, June question. It was March, June, 2018. It was part, um, it was called Blackmore. I think it's part B. But above all, put yourself in our mind. So go to the ACCA website, find that article, wherever it is, the article that I said was, read the mind of a marker. Of an ACCA marker. And you'll be much better in terms of sorting this exam out. Thank you, happy studying, and above all, the very best of luck in the exam.